Tuesday, March 7th, 2023, City Commission Work Session number two. And uh, we are going to convene the meeting and uh, we'll do one more roll call for the night. Commissioner Ruffy Smith? Here. Commissioner Mike Mitchell? Here. Commissioner Adam Morrow? Here. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Here. And Mayor Denise McGriff? Here. So you went back. I thought we were all going to stay on this side. So it looks like the dais is tipping over. I, I don't want to be accused of being left leaning. So. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're out there, it's right leaning. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for that very accurate description. <laughs> Stage, anyway, stage left. Stage left. So we just had a uh, work session with our planning commission, and I just want to again thank all the planning commissioners for taking the time out to come. We have some interesting topics um, regarding housing that we need to sort through, and I think that uh, all the minds that we have in our community are going to be needed to help us uh, go through this and also help solve um, a, a problem. Uh, and, and come to resolution that works really well for Oregon City. So I appreciate um, their work and their thinking about this. So tonight on our agenda, um, did we need to say anything about future work session items or that's just a given that's the list and we're going to, anything else we need to say about that? I do have a you have a question about I, that? I do have a question about um, something that's been on there for a long time now, but given our recent discussion at our goal setting retreat, um, if we keep on the climate action plan presentation, um, just in light of our recent discussions over the weekend. I think, I still think we should have a presentation. It's still worth, there are community members that are interested in that. It's, and it's not on a date certain, it's down down towards the end. So I think it's, it's worth, um, you know, having that, and, and maybe we might get lucky and Mark Gamba will come in and talk to us about it. Well, I, I do agree that we talked about interfacing with other components of the community, whether it be the school board or other sure. elected officials. That has value. Yep. Um, I think... Um, I think, I think basically we're still in alignment. I'm, I'm glad to see that we, um, the new authority from the state about setting speed limits is, is something that uh, is something near and dear to many members of our community. And then of course we have a budget coming up. So I think that's, that we need to have a discussion about that as well. All right, looks like that's an easy one. So let's move on to the next item, which is we have, um, some discussion items. We have a presentation from the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council annual report, and I believe you guys have submitted a, a PowerPoint, and I hope all the commissioners have had a chance to look at that. So, um, who's introducing this? Hi. Do you want to go ahead and acknowledge those folks, please? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to do that during the presentation, if that's okay. Sure. Um, but I'll go Is your light on there? Our, 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 oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Thank yeah. you. I didn't realize I had to press the go button. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it's green. that. Green means go. All right. Now you've got the booming voice of Tom here. So, um, very good. Well, thank you very much for the time tonight uh, to present, and I will go ahead and acknowledge uh, the rest of my my commission, my board. Uh, so, our chair is Chetamir Jessic. Our vice chair is Marcia Sinclair. Our secretary is Danielle Folliard. Our treasurer is Allison Heimowitz, and uh, our members at large are Doug Neely and Sarah Miller. And so uh, hopefully they're, they're tuning in virtually and I'm seeing some, uh, some bright flashing colors over here on the screen. I so. yes. that, that's right, who was watching. So I'm gonna slip in a few secret notes here during the presentation. Uh, it was about a year ago that I got to present to you 
and uh, I'm happy to report I'm still here. I'm excited about that. Uh, and also that I am now a full-time employee of the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. At that time, I was part-time. So our council is, uh, is moving forward. We've also established an office at the Kruger House in Oregon City. And uh, we do a lot of work out of that office. So tonight what I'd like to do is highlight a few of the projects for you that we've been working on in the past year. Uh, and we won't get into too much detail on these, uh, but the list that you uh, see before you are uh, kind of an overview of those. So I'll uh, go ahead and advance my slide. Um, I did want to say one thing about uh, this photo that we're looking at right here, which is post-project. Post uh, post-project is an exciting term because it means we actually accomplish something. And so that's actually a photo point, and I'll talk about that in a moment when we, we get to the next, uh, when we get to the, the projects themselves. So where are you standing to take that picture? <laughs> yeah, that's, we're gonna switch. Is there any way you could use this? I'm Absolutely, sure why, yeah, no, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And turn that one off, is that okay? Sure. All right. Actually, I'm happier without that in my face. Yeah, so uh, this is down in Knoll Creek Canyon. And uh, this, is, uh, this was actually in January. No, I'm sorry. This was the end of December. Uh, and it was a healthy hike to get down there. Uh, but these photo points are a requirement of our project documentation. And they help us to document change over time. So essentially, when we do the work, uh, then we can go back. And we are required to go back at two and four years after the implementation or the construction uh, to be able to to show what we've done. So we'll, uh, we'll jump to the next project. And this clicker doesn't seem to be where, is there a place I should point it? There you whoop, whoop. It just okay, worked right now. There. OK. There we go. Great. Uh, so before I get into projects, though, I just want to uh, start out with a little bit of context here. So uh, our goal is really to improve watershed health uh, to support native fish and other wildlife species. And uh, this uh, image here for me is, as a biologist, is something that really uh, sings to me. But I also know that it sings to the native fish that live in our watersheds. This is the kind of habitat that they are looking for. Cool, clear water uh, that is free of pollution, that is free of sediment, uh, for the most part, uh, that's shaded with healthy riparian habitat. And so our goal is really to kind of create these conditions that once existed and made uh, the watersheds in this area very, very important and flourishing uh, habitat for wildlife in uh, the Willamette and really the lower Columbia watershed basin. So where we work and what we do, uh, I introduced our, our board. Um, we have six very dedicated board members. And uh, Doug is one of the founders, along with Sarah Miller and Allison Heimowitz. Uh, and we can trace this back to 2004. So this shows the commitment that these individuals have as volunteers. And uh, they've really been an inspiration to me. Um, our board is all volunteer, and they work not only at the level of uh, meetings every other month, but they also do uh, committee work in between that. And so uh, I really feel that they're active and important. These are uh, the areas where we work, the Abernathy Creek Basin, the Beaver Parrot Creek Basin, and then the frontal uh, watersheds that feed down in above and below Willamette Falls here in Oregon City. And so I'm going to highlight some of the work that we're doing in there. Uh, habitat restoration, which often involves invasive species removal and native plantings. Uh, we provide technical assistance, education and outreach, and stakeholder engagement. And I'll highlight what that uh, looks like here in a moment. Very exciting project that started long before I began with the council. And the more I learned uh, about Newell Creek Canyon, the more I uh, discovered that this was really a couple decades in the making. Uh, so this partnership was with Metro. And uh, the Metro funding and the Oregon Watershed Enhancement uh, Board funding were provided through the Clackamas Partnership. This is a group of watershed councils and other organizations and agencies that helps to support the Clackamas populations of native fish, inclu including coho salmon, Chinook salmon, cutthroat trout, 
uh, Pacific lamprey, steelhead, and uh, in other watersheds, bull trout. And we're on the uh, cusp of trying to discover how to restore chum salmon, uh, which I think is very likely in the Abernethy watershed at some point. Uh, this total project uh, installed over 200 logs in 30 structures in Knoll Creek Canyon and four additional structures uh, along the main stem of Abernathy. And I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail here, uh, but this could not have taken place without a lot of partnership work. Exciting part of it was the helicopters. So in order to get into Knoll Creek Canyon, uh, Mayor McGriff, you mentioned it, you know, steep Harry, it's a difficult place to climb into or out of. Uh, so a helicopter uh, showed up last July and very carefully choreographed, uh, moved 200 logs down into these placements. Uh, and there were technicians on the ground working on the design to make sure these logs were pr placed appropriately to get the best habitat value. Uh, what we're looking for there uh, is trapping gravels, creating pool and riffle and glide habitat, and also uh, ultimately slowing that stream down and cooling the waters as well. Knoll Creek Canyon, uh, Knoll Creek is an important cool water input to Abernethy Creek, which in turn flows into the Willamette. Uh, Willamette River native fish are now outnumbered by invasive species in the lower Willamette, below Willamette Falls. So warm water species are starting to dominate and that's a problem. So these are the kinds of solutions that we need. All right. Uh, this is a project that I'm particularly excited about. This is a partnership with the City of Oregon City and Public Works. Uh, the Scattering Canyon project, again, another one that began before I started with the council, uh, but very exciting, and I think the rainbow really honors uh, the day and the work. It was fun to take that picture uh, and to see uh, that 30 acres now of stormwater runoff will be treated uh, more practically uh, before it enters Newell Creek Canyon, so sediment will be allowed to uh, as the water slows through this structure, uh, it will, uh, sediment will um, uh, settle out and uh, pollutants will also be then taken up by plants. So there's a native planting going uh, on there. Uh, the council helped with design on that, uh, but it was really the, the city doing the big lift on that one. So we appreciate that partnership. Hello. I'm not sure if it's the batteries or what, but if you want to advance the slide, Sorry. that that's okay. Well, we can talk about some more. <laughs> All right. Um, so another project that we are partnered with the city on is the Abernathy Shade Project. And the Abernathy Shade Project has been going, uh, it was really conceived in 2018 by my predecessor, Rita Baker, uh, who was the council coordinator at that time and the council themselves. Uh, and we work in partnership with Public Works, uh, Brian Monin, former City of Oregon City employee, uh, and now Marcos Kubo will work with us on this project. And the goal is really to shade the creek by improving riparian habitat. So riparian is that area that's influenced by the creek. It's along the edges of the creek, but it can actually extend quite a ways up the hillside. And here we have a willing property owner. So this is our newest site. It's on Tour Creek. And uh, we have a willing property owner who is in fact uh, not only uh, supported the idea of riparian restoration on her property, but also is uh, treating uh, outside of that riparian zone and restoring habitat with her own funds. So uh, it's really a nice example of leverage where a city dollar goes farther uh, because it's helped through the Watershed Council, it's helping us to leverage uh, private investment in habitat restoration. Uh, one of our more visible projects has been the work that we've been doing uh, with the Oregon uh, City Parks and Recreation Department. And I really want to acknowledge uh, Kendall Reed and John Waverly uh, for being partners with us both at Abernathy Creek Park, where we worked last year with an Oregon Community Enhancement Grant. Uh, and this year we're working at Singer Creek Park as well as Abernathy Creek Park. So at Abernathy Creek Park, uh, we will be extending that trail 
uh, if all planning goes well, uh, to complete the loop there. And we've already installed native plants that are doing very well. Uh, you remember last year, Jerry Herman uh, helped us with that in his Rivers of Life crew. And uh, those plants are very well established uh, and we're pleased with that. So this uh, past four weekends, we've been out rain, snow, shine. We did uh, postpone last weekend or the weekend prior to last weekend, uh, but we had great volunteer involvement, uh, people out there helping us to plant. So we've been doing some invasive species removal at Singer Creek for quite a while, uh, back starting in uh, December, and then uh, for four weekends, and now uh, we'll be out there again this next weekend with Boy Scouts uh, to do some more planting, and then once more in April for some more invasive species removal. So uh, we're working hard on this. We've also made connections with the neighborhood associations there uh, and with the disc golfers. So uh, there may be an opportunity for collaborative funding in the future, uh, maybe a grant proposal to try and put in some uh, tees and uh, interpretive signage, which I know is something that the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee has expressed some interest in. All right, now I'll move along. I realize I'm, I'm taking a little more time. Um, I really, uh, I wanna highlight this project. This is a, what's called an Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board small grant, so a total of $15,000. Uh, it's matched in this case, both by private landowner contributions and also by uh, the um, Oregon Depart or the uh, USDA Department of Agriculture Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program or CREP program, uh, and we are doing riparian enhancement there on a few acres along upper, Ab well, lower Abernathy, excuse me, Creek, uh, and just last week uh, installed over 2,000 plants in this area. So uh, this is a case where a landowner, uh, several landowners have come together and are really committed uh, to trying to improve the habitat. You can see it, it's beautiful along there, but it's really lacking that kind of large wood and that uh, shading that, that we need for the creek. All right, uh, Holcomb Creek large wood restoration. We'll be back to tell you this story next year, hopefully as a completed construction project. So we just submitted permitting uh, today and hope uh, to the county and hopefully that goes well. Uh, this will install about 17 pieces of large wood. Again, a private landowner has come forward uh, for this project. We know that we have lamp, Pacific lamprey and coho spawning in this area and using uh, this cool water tributary to Abernathy Creek at Holcomb Creek. This is right just off Redland Road. So uh, it's not a great place to stop and look. So please keep your eyes on the road. But at some point, I'll bring some pictures back to you post-implementation. And we're very excited about this project as well. And then I mentioned I was going to come back to stakeholder engagement. So. Uh, our council has been working with the Beaver Lake Homeowners Association uh, to help them think about some problems related to that impoundment. Uh, Beaver Lake is a large warm water lake that uh, really is there because of a dam that was built in the 70s. And uh, that habitat uh, or that lake is contributing warm water to Lower Abernathy Creek. Uh, it is also an area where the uh, property owners uh, recognize that the, the values that they uh, have come to expect out of that lake are challenged by the sedimentation in the lake, um, by bacterial uh, um, growth in the lake. And so we're at the beginning, really at the beginning stages of working in partnership with them to come up with conservation approaches that may be able to help with some of those problems. Um, those are complicated discussions, as you can imagine, uh, but we have a steering committee now. That steering committee uh, is working on the step-by-step -step process uh, that we will go through to visualize, to recognize the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, to that lake and uh, to the watershed. And then uh, to try and come up with some solutions. So ultimately, we want three consensus-based opportunities for restoration. And that may include uh, partial 
uh, dam removal or full dam removal. But at, those, at this point, those are just very early discussions. Uh, the key here is to think about how to solve the problems and to do it creatively and to recognize that there are technologies and methodologies out there that have been tried in other places that we can employ here uh, in conversation. So that project uh, should be concluded by this time next year. Uh, finally, just a quick picture of our financial support and expenditures. So our organization uh, really depends on grant funding. That is the, and the principal contributor of that is the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Uh, but more and more, uh, we are leveraging resources, trying to write grants uh, to bring in other partners to strengthen our base of funding. Uh, we do get some indirect support when we com uh, complete grants, and so that helps to give the board some flexibility in how they address future uh, needs for the organization. Uh, and on the expense side, you're looking at it. I'm, I'm the, their biggest expense. Uh, I hope I earn my pay. Uh, they, they also uh, afforded me an office uh, with a roof, and it's dry and warm in there. And so, uh, but I can't fit a wheelbarrow in it. So, right now, that's that's stored in a different place. Uh, but we're doing a lot of lot of work out in the community, and we're looking for partnership. And um, I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. And. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. Uh, since he uh, recognized Kendall Reed, the department, and I did want to recognize also John Lewis. He's, he's been a, a public works. He's both been great partners in our efforts. And, Even though uh, you're well recognized, you should probably still just say who you are in case somebody in the, out there in TV <laughs> land says, who is that guy? <laughs> oh, I'm... Uh, uh, who am I? Doug Neely. <laughs> As you said, one of the founding members. Uh, I, I might mention the uh, city commission formally recognized us the next year, to 2005, as did the county. Uh, but I did also want to mention uh, Tour Creek. A lot of people will, in the neighborhood will probably recognize it as Lifesea Creek, and it, the formal name of it is actually Tour Creek. But we've got our signage on those streams, so when you're driving by, seeing one of those signs there, uh, the city has installed them here, and also the county has installed several signs as well. So could you, I didn't quite hear which creek you said now has got signs on it? Uh, actually, all of the all creek of crossings, yeah, throughout the county, and uh, some of them are turned a little bit, so they're, they're turned toward the road, uh, but it's actually a great way um, for people to understand that we're out there. Our uh, symbolic, uh, our symbol, our, our uh, insignia is the lamprey, Pacific lamprey, right. uh, and we are working on restoring habitat for lamprey in those creeks for sure. Are there any questions or comments? Go right ahead. Um, no questions. I just want to thank you. Um, knowing, you know, how this group was when it started and seeing how much work has been accomplished, um, it's unbelievable, uh, the amount of work. So, um, Doug, thank you for being a founder of that, and thank you for all the other work that's been involved in so many years in growing that group and being able to hire staff. Um, seeing that report, we see reports um, every you know year, but but that was substantial, and it seems like um, the work is just ongoing and increasing every year. So it's sure. really exciting. Yeah. You know, I, I realized I, I made a, a grave mistake, and I apologize for that. One of our partners is Confluence AmeriCorps, and it has been for two years, and Willow Michaels is our AmeriCorps. She's our uh, education community outreach coordinator. Um, she has really been the engine behind all the work that you saw at Singer Creek and Abernathy Creek Park, and her predecessor, Derek Palmore. I could not possibly have done what, what we're doing yeah. there without so their help. Well, so. it's, a, it's a great program, and uh, I wish we could all utilize AmeriCorps, because I think it's, it, uh, utilizes uh, people's skills and it it's all ages too it's not just young that's people right. i mean that's what's great about it it's kind of like a peace corps for the for america instead of you know going overseas americorps basically helps in communities all over the united states which is fantastic yep uh, 
Uh, some of you may not really be aware of Scattering Canyon, which we talked about, but it's, it, if you, it's, it goes down below the mausoleum and drops down, and it's a nice walk to get down there. There are several what they so-call slag ponds that have been created by a, a drop of the land in the slide. It's a real beautiful area, and if you haven't got down into that area, I would really suggest it's part of the cemetery. Other comments? Go ahead. This is more personal curiosity than anything else other than the Holcomb stream. Do the other streams enjoy Andromus fish, migratory fish? They do. Uh, so the council, when I came on board, uh, had developed through the work of a contractor named Todd Alds Alsbury uh, with Altap Restoration, a strategic restoration action plan for Abernathy Creek native fish. And that plan is on our website. And that really lines out, if you, if you open up that plan, it's got 25 different projects in it. We're pursuing those. Uh, but Root Creek, uh, which is up at the headwaters, um, um, Thimble Creek is another area. So really, uh, it's anadromous all the way up to its headwaters. There's definitely a challenge there, and uh, the Beaver Lake folks are aware of it with that fish ladder. We've got some passage issues, but we do know that anadromous fish get above uh, there. And then we also have anadromous fish in Beaver and Parrot Creeks. Um, as far as the, the creeks that feed directly into uh, the Willamette in Oregon City, like Singer Creek, it's not anadromous anymore. Uh, it, it is a cool water input, so that's a very important function that it plays. Does, is Beaver Lake susceptible to algae bloom? It is. Does that, uh, contribute, they, does that contribute to any situations that we have downstream? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to comment on, on that other than to say that the Beaver Lake Homeowners Association hires uh, someone to manage that lake, as does Hidden Lake, and I know that they are actively working to control those algal blooms, but I, I don't have specific information for you. I can certainly try to find out. That's not um, necessary. Yeah, but I, you know, I think... Uh, algal blooms uh, and harmful algal blooms are something that we will expect to see more of with the warming of, of the earth. And so I think that's one of the reasons that it's a priority for us to try and, one, protect the cool water inputs, and two, try to uh, really restore that riparian habitat and see if we can shade inputs, uh, smaller creeks and streams. And finally, knowing that the lamprey has a significant part in the American Indian culture, Native American culture, are they participants in any way with any of your efforts? So our, our council is working uh, with tribal members through the Clackamas Partnership. So um, both the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs and uh, separately we work with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde in okay. partnership on some of our projects. Uh, we've also uh, worked in Beaver and Parrot Creek uh, with a uh, effort there to try to actually remove an impoundment. Um, so tomorrow I have a meeting, or Thursday, I have a meeting, uh, and there are tribal members that are involved in that project. Beautiful 80-acre site, uh, very healthy riparian habitat there, but there is an old remnant dam uh, that we're trying to get rid of, trying to put help them to construct a bridging structure across there and use it for uh, uh, really cultural healing. Is, is the focus of that project. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. I just had a, a question, and maybe it's not one we can totally answer tonight, but I know that Beaver Lake was created, you know, probably in the 40s or 50s. 1970s. So in the 70s. So yeah. what is it backing? What is the stream that comes through there that's backing this up that makes this particular man-made situation? And you already mentioned that it has a, a detrimental effect to downstream because it's warm it's a warm water that's been sitting there and sitting there percolating and then it kind of so if it was to be let's just say breached I haven't been over there probably in about five or six years but I know there's a bunch of homes are all around it so I presume some of this might be in a flood zone or something to that effect yes yeah, so so Abernathy Creek uh, is the creek that is above 
Beaver Lake and also below Beaver Lake. Uh, Abernathy Creek has tributaries above Beaver Lake. Um, principally, uh, Port Blakely owns quite a bit of property up there, Metro, BLM, and then some private landowners. Uh, and there are other unnamed tributaries to Abernathy above there. We know that fish passage occurs at Beaver Lake through that fish ladder, and the Homeowners Association has worked to try to uh, restore and improve that fish ladder, but it's just not working very well. Uh, the beaver, the lake itself, uh, as an impoundment, it, it is a heat sink, so it warms up. Um, as that sediment is accreting, it becomes a, a challenge for them to keep it as deep as they would like. Uh, so th these are the kinds of things that we'll be working to discuss with the Homeowners Association. We put a technical assistance to grant together with them to the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board to fix the fish ladder. Uh, they really, they declined that that proposal, so we went back to the Homeowners Association and, and we came up with this approach for stakeholder engagement. And as I said, we're kind of at the beginning of sure, that, sure. and I know for those homeowners who bought into a lakefront property, that's a challenge to think about it not being a lake. So really, that's not yeah. where we well, start. Well, no, I'm, I said it. Nobody else has said it, but I mean, is it used right? right? Where, where we start yeah. is thinking about what are the opportunities to enhance or create better conditions in Abernathy Creek as it flows through that lake. Um, so there's a lot of creativity, hopefully, that we're going to bring to this process uh, and build consensus. Is That's, it used recreationally for non-motorized? It is used by the homeowners recreationally, yeah. Motorized or non-motorized? I believe non-motorized, but... Uh, so I'm thinking motorized has seemed to me that's a conflict with whatever's in there. Are there, is there anything else in there? There are warm water species, species. in the lake, yeah, of fish. Uh, but it's, you know, it's privately owned. It's a private dam. It's a private lake. Um, they've worked hard to uh, understand how to uh, make sure that that dam is safe for the downstream property owners in the event of any kind of a disaster. Uh, and they have specific requirements that, that they have to work through for that. Good. So, thank, thank you for that. Thanks. I wanted I wanted to uh, acknowledge another agency on Beaver Lake came up, working closely with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife on that particular project. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I would acknowledge uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as uh, a key partner for us as well. Um, and there must have been beaver in it at one time, otherwise they wouldn't be calling it Beaver Lake, I suspect. There, there are beaver above Beaver Lake, below Beaver Lake. In fact, uh, the Echo Valley Rest Riparian Restoration Project, one of our big challenges will be to keep the beaver from chewing up all of the riparian plantings that we put in there. So the property owner, uh, one of the property owners, actually all of them, are well aware of this. Uh, and we're possibly, depending on the council's interest in this, uh, putting an intern on uh, helping us to understand how to best do that this summer. So I have a, a local student who's interested uh, in working on that, but I haven't proposed Make it yet the to the council. plants taste bad to beavers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certain plants do, certain plants do not, yeah. yeah. And uh, we have beaver excluders. There's actually a device I learned about called a beaver deceiver. Oh. Yeah, which is they, they, when you have a culvert, beavers tend to be attracted to the culvert, and then they want to block it up because they realize that that causeway that the culvert is running through is a great dam. So a beaver deceiver is actually a structure put far away from that culvert, and the beavers build up the dam around there, and then it just drops and then flows through the culvert. So at least that's the theory. That's the theory, yeah. yeah. They're, they're smart. They learn. Yeah. That's right. Any other comments or questions? So thank you again. We, you know, we really do appreciate getting these updates because I think it's important for the community to know that, uh, you know, that small changes are happening and that they are for the, for the best for the environment. Well, and speaking of better for the environment, our annual report will be available in uh, electronic form on our website. I have stacks of printed past annual reports in my office. They act like insulation. So we're not printing this year. We're going to go with an electronic format. So, But you can get it on our website. Okay. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. I All appreciate, right. appreciate your time. It. All good things happening there. You need the mic back or 
Okay, leave it there. All right, who's up next? I am. <clears throat> All right. So tonight, um, I'd like to give a presentation and receive feedback concerning city-sponsored public events. Uh, so one of the um, items that we've talked about and was asked to prioritize was that uh, in the current existing biennial budget, we'd identified community-sponsored events, $50,000 a year to go to help support uh, events over the summer. Uh, so we've put together um, a program uh, to get those funds out um, f for this upcoming summer uh, event season. Um, so we have both in the staff report as well as um, the, the program itself and the guidelines. So really it's, it's trying to uh, support um, events that will take place in, within our community. Um, We've identified for nonprofit, for profit businesses. Um, the program would provide up to 50% of eligible product, project costs up to a maximum of $20,000. Um, the approving board, in this case, we propose that it be the city commission that review the applications and determine the funding allocations uh, based on the submittals. And um, as well as the ability to distribute those funds up front. We do have some ability to hold back funds uh, until all the invoices and our receipts are presented against the eligible costs. Um, it also allows the commission in reviewing an application um, if it wanted to award 25% instead of 50%. It has that flexibility built in. The 50% or the 20,000 was, was set as a max. Um, it didn't mean it had to be that. Um, and also, you know, that number, that percentage is up to the commission to, to determine if that's appropriate or if they'd like more flexibility in that. Um, and if you, you know, really the objective here is to um, try to start moving towards um, a more, um, you know, reoccurring events, starting to build capacity. Um, and if that's not something the commission's interested in, just let us know. We can take that component out. But it's really how do we start to create these, these events that bring, um, that, that support tourism, support our businesses that are here locally, um, you know, are incorporated into the branding and the logoing that we have for, for tourism and for the city, um, and how do they start to build and be able to expand. Uh, that was the intent the way it was written. I know that's a little bit different than how we've done things in the past, um, so ha happy to kind of stop there and just get first thoughts because I'd really love to then kind of work through the program criteria, what we're thinking. Um, you may have noticed, you know, we've got a pretty aggressive timeline. So if there are significant changes, that's fine. You know, we'll bring them back. Just realize, you know, what we gave you here was kind of a best case, you know, if you're comfortable with this program or comfortable with some small tweaks, you know, we could probably get this going pretty quick. Um, you know, if we need to bring it back, just realize, you know, everything will slide a little bit just um, in order to, you know, get the program approved, get it out, give people, give organizations enough time to apply and then the commission enough time to review an award. Um, so I could stop there or I could keep going into the specifics of the criteria if you'd like. Well, I think that um, you guys want to just stop here and let's discuss because I, I mean, as we all know, there are a couple of events that are already in the planning stages because they're going to come up in July and uh, we need to, you know, get this as close to perfect as we possibly can so we can move those particular events that are already in the pipeline going because they are important events to the community and... Uh, I think the biggest issue that I see is that, you know, we're trying to have some of these come out of, you know, our situation with COVID, and that's been, you know, it's been a little uh, trial and error trying mm -hmm. to get them ramped back up because of, of that, and I hate to say it's still going to be with us for a while. Commissioners? Go ahead, Rocky. Um, 
So I think this is simplified, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, the uh, only couple questions that came up for me, one is, um, this doesn't say, it, it says something about, you know, in order to be city um, sponsored or classified as a signature event to get this funding that um, needs to be open to the public. Um, did you see the word signature anywhere? Because I didn't. Yes, I did. Okay, where is it? Right at the top, sentence, first sentence. Oh, signature. Okay, they're up there. <laughs> yeah, I must have blipped anyway, that. I, I still think we need to go through every document in the city and parks department because we, even in this document, we're talking about two. If it's a signature event, call it that. If it's a, yeah, I, 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 we're, we get so confused. In in in, some, in parks, it's labeled different things, and um, I'm still so confused about it. But simplifying that would be great. Um, I, it says open to the public. I assume. Um, that means that the general public has access. It does not preclude gate fees or admission fees to events. I think the intent was that it's open to the public. For not, free. Yes. Well, it doesn't say that. And okay. I, I, um, so I think that's something we need to... Can you point what out would it? you like? Are you... Well, I mean, if someone was going to, um, for instance... Um, the second bullet first point. City, can you just... Oh, I'm just I'm trying to ask where you are. It doesn't matter where it's in there. It says it's open to the public, but it doesn't specify whether or not the event could be gated or not, or an admission fee can be charged or not. Well, it says so they my, do not limit attendance or partnership. I'm just trying to... I just, I'm just i going to follow along where you are. So if you're going all over the place, then tell me that you're going all over the place and point out where you are so that we can follow along, because that's the problem I've been having. I'm not sure where... Where Here's the problem I'm having. You keep interrupting me, and I'm, I'm not pointing to anywhere in the document other than the fact that I'm asking whether or not, because I've read it, there's nothing in there that says anything about gate fees or admission or ticketing or anything. So, for instance, if downtown does First City Festival or another festival where they have, you know, a suggested donation, I'm sure it's looked at separately, but... If someone rents Clackamas Park and the park is an event and it's a five dollar charge to get in, does that exclude um, that event from um, this program? That's one question. And, and can I just so I think we've we've struggled with this before in the past. If we're going to invest public funds, should it be open to the public? Not saying that events inside it you know aren't paid for or a donation isn't requested and and i we'll do whatever the commission thinks is appropriate if we're comfortable saying we'll invest let's just say you know ten thousand dollars in your in this event but there's a you know a five dollar gate fee which means if i don't have five dollars i'm not getting into this event you know if if that's what the commission would like, we can write that. I think we've always kind of pushed on, if we're putting public money in, it should be open to the public. And, you know, you're going to get paid if you're buying drinks or buying food or, you know, buying merchandise. And if somebody wants to make a donation, so be it. And so uh, we're open to either. We've just kind of always leaned the other, to the open to the public if we're using public funds. I honestly can see it going either way. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily care either way, but my um, going back to why we even have this system, right? The, the only reason we have a system or want a system to be able to grant events money is because this community says this is what makes our city feel the way it, we want it to feel. This is what makes a hometown. This is why that these events are important, okay? But we've never seen any ability to equate the amount we're giving to the amount of the actual spends of the event. For instance, you know, if we say, well, and this gives some, you know, um, this gives us the option as a commission to adjust that, but, um, when the whole purpose of us 
having city events is to subsidize events that couldn't survive because the city was charging way too much for closing streets, was closing, you know, charging much for police or various other things. So that's what this is for. Um, so I think at some point there needs to be some ability to say, well, to do this type of an event, this is how much it costs, and the amount that we're giving should be equatable to that. Because if you do an event that costs fifty thousand dollars to put on, and we give you twenty thousand dollars, you know, that's a huge expense to put on an event. So having a gate fee to, to to come up with the extra expense may be warranted, right? Because um, you know the event's just not pencil without doing that. So that's kind of why I'd like to see a tie. This also, you know, I understand this as a temporary thing to get us through this summer, which by the way, this is exactly what I asked for to get us through last summer, which we completely failed on. Um, this though doesn't acknowledge the fact that how this process can work. When, a, when, a, when an event applies to this, are they just getting these guidelines and then, uh, uh, or are, are we using that, um, application form as the application for the grant? Or is there a separate application for the grant? Or are they just writing, are they just coming to present? Or how is that going to work? There'll be, uh, my understanding is that there'll be an application. It'll be the application that we have online that would, that... I'd, I'd have to get back to you okay. on what exactly we're going to use, because I don't think we rolled out the online one. Um, and if, you, since you're presenting this, is this not going through economic development, or this is still economic development, correct? This is still economic, yes. Okay, so will economic development then be handling, because by the way, the grant money that we are giving to these events most likely is not going to go for anything other than paying the city back, <laughs> right? Because that's what they need. So, what, so that goes back to the issue is when they get a grant from the city, who decides how they go to the police department or public works or to all these other things? And is that all going through economic development like we talked about, or does this go back to where I get a grant from the city to pay for everything, now I gotta hire police, so I go to police station, I figure that out, and I go to public works with my money to uh, deal with the closers, and then um, I give the city the receipts that the city gave me to get reimbursed. <laughs> to get the money from the city, is that, or is it, because the whole purpose of this was to have one application right. so that they go to economic development, they get the grant, and then they figure out who, which departments are charged and how that money gets figured out, because if someone's asking for a grant from the city to subsidize it, it's most likely because they're paying the city back for services that the city is, is charging them for. It's so possible. It, it, it's possible they could, you know, if it's a large enough event, you know, we tried to identify a broad range of eligible reimbursable costs, whether it's promotions, fees, equipment purchase, supply purchase, security. So depending on where we set the bar, you know, is, is, an, is 50 percent of event an event typically city charges? Right, we could ask Liz to come up. It might be easier. No, I, don't, I would assume it could be, um, but that doesn't answer the question of whether or not that individual event organizer has to go to all these city departments, or if this has been right. Um, this has been organized and 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 created in in the way that we were in, um, basically implied that it had been done all this work that had been done to do a, a, a unified um, application and that all the departments were unified in figuring this out. I don't know that we're really there. We've been kind of told we were there, but I don't, I've well, seen we, a, a document, but right. not any other than that. Right, I think the, the intent was to consolidate under one point of contact with the city. We brought that, we presented it. Um, it was, there were work that was, identified by the commission that had to happen. So the intent is to try to get there. Is it ready to go? I don't have the answer to that. I can get you that answer. Because, okay. you know, so we're trying to, we were trying to move this because we realize, you know, it's coming fast. 
you know, from a staff standpoint, we felt like we had done a pretty good job of working across multiple departments to come up with a single point of contact process. Um, you know, there were some concerns raised and, you know, but, you know, that's the intent of trying to get there. So the answer is yes to that? I'm going <laughs> to, we, we felt, we baby. felt like we had a good pro. We it's presented to, to the mayor okay. and to Commissioner Smith. We presented to this group. Right. There were a lot of issues brought up. Um, you know, so is it perfect? No. Okay. But, we're, 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 but our goal we're is trying to point get of there. contact. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, so, I mean, that stuff is going to come as we go through it. I get that. So I don't have an issue of holding this up. I think, you know, this gives us flexibility. This. Um, gives us an ability to get to the events for the summer. Um, I guess I, I, I would I would be open to, I guess I'm, I'm not opposed to this including events that have, you know, admission to them if it's, and so I guess we just approach that when it comes and we define whether or not that's suitable for the particular event or, or and how they're, financials pencil out because if they're like well this event doesn't work unless we do some sort of an admission or donation then I think we have to equate that individually unless because it, it, it wasn't that it was an issue for me it's that if I was an event planner reading this I, that would be the first thing I would ask mm -hmm. right because I would want to know well can I charge admission can I not so you're going to get so we need to know kind of what the answer to that is well, if, if is there a strong feel, feeling amongst the commission like I, I kind of explained where I yeah. come from in terms of using public I, funds. I get that, um, but I think it can go. Can I, can I go yeah. What do you think? Admission or no admission, or it depends. development then in turn goes to each of the impacted departments, gathers those costs and presents them to the people putting on the event. Is that correct? I don't know what's correct. That's what we were working for. Is that, is that, is that that's, the goal? That's a goal. That's the goal. That is a goal. We had, we had okay. created an online application system that you could walk through that would identify fees depending on what the request was. So the objective was to avoid the, you know, visiting three departments and, and serve yeah. through ECDEF. Right. Now, we haven't got to try it yet. We rope, you know, we played with an application and then, you know, it kind of got slowed down. See, I can see a combination of both approaches, a min minimal gate fee combined with a surcharge from goods and services sold, which is also going to be hard to, to monitor. So, you know, maybe the gate fee is the simplest. I don't know. Any opinion one way or the other? Um, uh, we've, we've stated in here that the deciding body can lower that 50% threshold. So maybe, maybe we say in here that... Um, that it's possible that, it, that if mandatory gate fees are going to be charged, that might lower the 50%. And then as who said, one of the two of you gentlemen said, it, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Oh, that, that was Commissioner Smith. Yeah, I guess I'd be in favor of that kind of an approach on that. Adam? I would agree, but if the objective is to get something occurring on an annual basis, I worry about wanting to streamline it so it occurs on an annual basis while at the same time worrying about if we're going to tinker with the formula each year it comes by as well. So um, I personally have a hard time um, wanting to invest public funds in something that would not include the general public. Um, however, I do understand that in, in some of these cases uh, it's one of the only ways to make the uh, books balance. But again, um, the whole 
are one of the main tenets of this program is to establish annual events um, that will provide some stability for both the city and the programmers to make it easier for them. And I just worry about if we go deciding on a case-by-case -case basis that that would kind of upset the whole, one of the main purposes of the program, which is to provide a, an expedited process. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I guess what I would say is that I was looking at the first bullet point because that's what you drew my attention, so please forgive Except my apology. I was trying to follow where you were, so I, you weren't anywhere and you were telling me that, so I apologize. So in the first bullet point on page two, there's no page numbers, page two starts, it says city-sponsored public events are open to anyone and, and <laughs> anyone and to everyone that wants to attend or participate. So maybe you could say something in there, uh, are open at, in parentheses, that does not charge admission but does not preclude requests for donations. I mean... To me, if it's a, a city-sponsored event that's open to everybody, um, so take for example, so you, first, first, first city. So I don't know how you would block it off to get admission because there's this street, that street, you can come in from this side and come in. I mean, it's like, yeah, she's shaking her head. Yeah, it is but, blocked but off, but see, it's a donation. Me, right, it's still, still, yeah, can, can, yeah, go ahead. Open to everybody. It is. If they pay an admission fee, it is so open to everyone that accepts them. So I said, if, if we're deliberately saying no admission fee, we need to say that. But I don't think reading that it says that. No, it, to me, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm reading it. I'm, I wrote that in there. Yeah. I didn't say that's what it says. I don't know it says we, it is open to. And I, I guess that I don't have any problem with people putting on events that request donations. I, I just, you know. It, an admission, in some cases, is going to preclude community members from being able to go. So I guess the other the other question I have, I wrote just some things down. So I think with the cost of inflation and everything, so you have, I wrote a note you said here, should the cost of the event, the, the grant be tied to the cost of actually putting the event on. Um, the other thing is, is that I'm still struggling with the scenario you laid out, which we talked about before, so XYZ applies for a grant, they get $20,000, and let's say $10,000 of that is to pay the city for doing something. So to me that makes, we're giving a grant to pay ourselves to get, to give back, so but that's what we've all, I mean, that's, that's the reason we, well, we've I know. done that for eternity. I know. But some, right? of, the, some of these I mean, things, we, they're... <laughs> that's how we did the flower baskets. We would board our own grant to do the flower baskets until we said, hey, if this is important, then put it in the budget. Well, yeah, well, we did. But, I mean, it seems to me that there, if the city is sponsoring it, there should be some provision for in-lieu services because we want it to be successful as well. And I know we're saying, well, where's that money going to come from that, you know, the guy's out there from Public Works and he's putting up the barricades, so where's that money going to come from? But it seems to me that could be in addition to the grant. It's an, an additional contribution. So I'm, I'm just still, I'm still struggling, struggling with that. This but, is why I've been struggling with well, it I'm not str it, is, it is, there's so else, many elements of Everything it. else is fairly, fairly clear and straightforward to me, but I do want to say, please, they're all going to be called one thing. So whatever parks, <laughs> if we approve, we've approved this. So parks has got to change whatever they're calling it. I don't, I don't want it to be called a signature event in one place and a city-sponsored event someplace else and some, because it, again, it's confusing to me. And I'm sitting up here. So... We need to get the terms straight. So whoever wants to duke it out, that's what it needs to be called. Because maybe you just leave it out. Maybe you just say it's recognized by the city of Oregon City as an event that is open, you know, city-sponsored public events are recognized by the city of Oregon City that are open to the general public. Boom. Any direction on the, we're kind of all over the place on the, whether we char whether we, we either are going to let them charge or we don't. I mean, I don't want to do it on a case by case basis because that to me is confusing. I, I think we allow them to charge, but it has to be open to all. 
It has to, I'm sorry, it has to be what? Open, open to, all. to all. Like you have in here already. But I don't have a problem with an admission It's not, so it's thing. maybe, you can charge, but it's not, re it's not required, or I don't know. Do you have a comment? Do you want to come up and make a comment? Always. Since you have a signature, <laughs> since you have a signature event. Now there you go using signature. I know. Event. I'm doing it to be facetious. <laughs> of course, it is. Identify. Um, I'm Liz Hanna. I'm the director from the Downtown Brands Association. Hit it real quick. Yeah. Oh. Press the button. Thank you. Downtown Oregon City Association. There we go. Um, so I, I will say that. The, right now, in order to have balanced our budget and to pay for staff, we do have to charge for everything that we do. Um, and you won't find many organizations that, that can put on events that, can't, that don't charge. Um, so I, I understand that it has to be open to the public because it's public dollars that you're putting into it, but um, you're gonna preclude a lot of events. So Brewfest, first city celebration maybe, um, it is open to the public, but we rely on gate fees for a lot of that. Um, we lose about $20,000 on that event every year with staff included. So what, what I'm hoping that this, this grant money would do is put that $20,000 back into the organization so that we can then do more events. Um, so I can take some of that staff time and maybe have a, a second person that can do three more events throughout the year. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're building capacity. We're hoping to build capacity within this, this grant. I don't know if that's the intention, but that's, that's what, what I'm hoping to do with that funding. Um, and, and to your point, um, we do pay the city to, to do things, um, permitting, um, but we, we don't pay them a lot. So it's not a lot that's going back, it's not five, five to $10,000 that's going back into the city. Um, the city doesn't do road closures for us usually. They did it as a, as a, um, as a favor to the organization last year, um, but I, I, I wouldn't rely on that. So we go out to a, a third party, so we pay out to Northwest Traffic Control to, to close off the streets. So we are, putting money back into the community um, and not just the city with that money. I hope that's, that's clear. Um, a little bit goes back to the city, but not much. Um, and I guess my question would be, if the city can provide those services cheaper, then why wouldn't we do that? And that's why I'm saying, if we want these events to be free, then we need to figure out what the percentage of making sense to fund an event that makes it free. But saying, oh, randomly, we're gonna say the limit's 20,000 or 10,000. How do we know that if we're doing events that cost $50,000 um, to do, and that's why they have to charge? If we want free admission to these events, then we have to somehow tie the grant to what the actual charges are. And it makes no sense to have um, events go spend more money for outside vendors when if we think it's a city goal to have community events, then we need to put it in Public Works' budget or Parks Department to close off those streets. That's the big issue here. Yeah, I don't have and, to and so we have to work all those out. I, I think we're now trying to fix it, but also the pushing these groups away again, and that's what ends events. I think So it all has to be thought out, and it has to make sense, and that's why it's important to constantly talk to the people that know how to plan these events and why they move their events to other cities. I think, if I can just say one last thing, I think if you're excluding events that don't charge, you're gonna end up with just supporting the teddy bear parade and first city celebration. Those are really the only two that are, are genuinely open to the public where you can just walk in. Um, you know, Brewfest charges, uh, uh, the, art, the art show might be eligible. Um, and they, they don't, don't charge. They, um, they were going to this year, but um, if they can get support, maybe they, they won't have to. Um, so th there's a few events in there, but there, there are not many that don't charge. Um, yeah. Well, so I was specifically talking about First City. When you said we block it off and charge, I thought, 
When did we do that? We, we always block it off, so there are only two entrances right. to the downtown. That's mostly for OLCC purposes. Right, yeah, yeah um, I remembered that. But it is, we do funnel people there so that we can get donations. Um, we, we pretty consistently, it's almost the same amount every single year that we've done this event in 13 years. Um, so we rely on that as part of our budget for the, the year, um, hoping that we will get that, that income. That's helpful. I, I appreciate your suggestion about um, putting funding in the budget. So if we're going to support street closures for city events like First City, which is a citywide event, then yeah, I agree with that. That, that That's something we're going to do. I don't want to hold this yeah. up either, so I want to... So do we need to say you can charge, or, or should we just... Yeah. Would you like some specific language that says that they may charge for a charge? Uh, I don't know what we want to say, admission, or I don't know what the, to call it. <laughs> I'm fine if they charge, but here's what I'd say. I, I view it like each event is a standalone event, okay? So in the business world, you do what's called a closed job summary. You put something out the market, and then you summarize your costs and expenses at the end of it, and you see if you made money or you lost money. And maybe you're, if you're fortunate, you come back with a surplus of money from your gate fee. So at that point, the decision to be made is what happens to that surplus and who retains it. And do you ask for less the next year or whatever? Or so do, you, do you pay some form right. of it back and the city's in a position to put it out for the next event? And I guess in plainest language, would it go to the organization that puts on the event or does it go back to the city coffers? Or a percentage. I mean, if they sure, but that's all stuff. I mean, but that's that, legitimate. I think that, but that starts with a closed job summary. We put on this event. We thought it would cost us this. It cost us more than, less than, and this is what we got. And what do so we do with the monies? We can always revisit that after we get sure. something like that at the end. I'll so just I, say I, th that would preclude. Precru uh, preclude my plan to potentially put on more events with the surplus but but I, I can see where well, that's your perspective that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's and, a very and, narrow that's your perspective about we want to put on events yeah yeah We're so talking about I'm our just, ability I'm just to saying, finance them I'm just saying that that could it could go either way so if you want more events then I would say that that's probably not the the way that I would go but if you want why would um, that prevent you from putting on more events when the city would have more monies to put towards the events you're going to put on I'm I'm betting that not all of the events that we would put on would be um, would qualify for this money so not all of our events are going to be citywide for city celebration events right. um, but they might be wine walks that put you know 500 people into a into 20 businesses downtown and that that type of event i would not ask for city funding for because that's not it, that's a ticketed event that that we don't need closures we don't need any of that stuff so i would say we can put on more smaller events um with that kind of funding um that that wouldn't we wouldn't ask for city funding for so Th that's just my perspective, but have any problem with the organization keeping the maybe it, it, just a question. Would it make sense to make a distinction between um, nonprofit organization sponsored events and for profit businesses? Because I'm a little concerned about letting a for profit business charge an right. admission fee and us support them. But right. I don't have a problem with a nonprofit organization with a goal to help further our city, like DOCA. Right being able to charge admission. So is that our distinction? I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Do you, Adam? Okay, so can you put that in there? And then we asked specifically have the definitions be the same across the board. Um, we don't have a problem with it. With a, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a fee being charged. So I think other than that, we're good to go. Okay. I was going to make a motion, oh, but it's a work oh, session. Yeah, we can. I have, so I have a couple could, of... Could you ask, I, I, we could ask for a consensus. I hope we... I, I am, I'll just say this. I am, I am nervous that if I were a nonprofit, knowing this, I would never not charge a fee to put on a community event and get public funds. So uh, uh, hopefully after we run this through, we can maybe revisit it. I, I and I know we will be. Yeah. Um, it, uh, just 
it makes my equity fairness meter off a little. But I understand where we're coming from in terms of trying to support events. You know, are we supporting the events or are we supporting the organization, right? We put 60000 a year into DOCA. Um, it's just, it's, it's complex. And, and I acknowledge that 100%. Should we be, should we have a community of events in public works and PD that they can pull from? I, I agree. I think it's complex. I understand where you're trying to go. I just want to put out there that, you know, hopefully we can revisit this and see how it works. Let's see how I, it I works. don't Let's even, I, I would fully support saying no at gate fees if I knew that the amount that we were, that we were we basing these grants know, on right? had yeah. the ability to actually put on events. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that. You know? Sure. Um, but what I do know is that events cost way more than we think they do. And, <laughs> um, and $20,000 doesn't go a whole long way. No, it doesn't. Okay. Yes, sir. So it, he had one more comment. Uh, I've got a couple, but they're not all that complicated. Um, when it talks about recurring of recurring events, I have a little bit of a problem with that. For example, Archbridge celebration was a one-shot deal. Right. It's only 100 years old one time, but it was a worthy event for public support. So I wouldn't want to exclude non-recurring events. Or like if there's an anniversary event for we've one got, of the houses. We've got the other bridge coming up. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I have a little bit of a problem with that recurring thing. Um, I'd like to see on the eligible costs, eligible, yeah, under eligible costs, unless we figure out another way to handle things like the street closure fee, I think the eligible costs should include city fees, such as street closure fees. I think that was the intent. Yep. The uh, where, where was what? Under eligible costs. Right. Fees. So no, yeah, Tony just said that was the intent. I'm trying to. We can out add it. it. We'll add it. That was certainly okay. the intent. Okay. I think that, it, should that, just, yeah. it should just be spelled out. Yeah. Um, there's an application period, and I get it. But should we, not, if we don't spend, or if we don't allocate all of the grant money, and an event comes along later in the year, would we still be able to? grant that money. We're going to disperse whatever's, whatever is available and requested by the time period that's here, but if there's remaining funds, I'd like to see us be able to Could we that. do that as part of that night? Like, let's, let's, let's say we stick, let's say we pull, pull off this calendar is the way we've scheduled it, right? And then uh, the city commission does a grant approval, review and approval meeting on April 26th. And let's say at that meeting, the, we only disperse $70,000. I think we could probably at that meeting say, we're opening this up for the remaining yeah. 30000 Perfect. That way we, we, we know yeah. better idea instead of trying to guess now what's going to happen. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I, like, I like that. Okay. And, the, and the final thing, I don't see the point of that mega region map. I don't care where the tourists come from. Their money spends the same. I think we can just eliminate that. I, th I, I, I don't necessarily think that map was connected to the events other than the fact that they were showing us that that's the market that we've right. been marketing to in terms of tourism, but I, I, it just, it's, I, so I think that's all that was in there for. I think it was too. It was tied to the marketing that we were yeah. doing. That was where they were. Okay. So you want, so is there a consensus to remove any reference to the map? Remove map? Yes, no? I, sure. Sure, sure. Frank? Sure. Yes. Okay. We got a yes. I'm happy. Mike is happy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They'll be dancing. At, they'll be, Rocky happy. They'll be dancing in the streets coming right up. We'll, or actually, maybe we'll be dancing. In, oh, it's not snowing at the moment, so maybe we, we won't be dancing in the snow. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to revisit this. That is, that's on the on the table. We're so, going to revisit this. Next, next year. Okay, next year. Okay, or, so or after I, I guess you know this is a program that staff has created. Yeah. Based on the comments that I've heard, if those are incorporated, is the commission comfortable with us moving forward with advertising it and with the count, you know, trying to hit the calendar that we yeah, put together? Right. Meaning, okay. We 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 put this out yes. in March. Sure, you got to test it. Okay. It yes. 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 
Yes, okay. yes. Then, then we're not going to bring this back. No. Okay. We, but we will after the season. After the season. Revisit. We're bringing this, I don't mean a year, I meant after the season. After this, whatever that's, because there's some stuff that goes on in December, so we'll, you know, we'll see. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rocky. All right, let's talk about street design standards. My third favorite topic. <laughs> tonight is your third favorite. Topic. Exactly. Tonight, yeah. tonight, yes, yes. Is there a ten slide limit on these? Brackets? No, no. John, John Lewis has my carte blanche. I love John Lewis's slideshows, so you know, I, I'm totally for it. <laughs> See how beloved he is in this. Thank in you. Thank here. you. They're all smiling. See, everybody's smiling. Well, I'm gonna, I am going to present this slideshow. Um, it's not mine, though. I'll give the credit where credit is due. I think our Kittleson team and Josh Wheeler put, a, the line, uh, put all the work into this slideshow. Um, Josh couldn't be here tonight, so I'm presenting. So uh, we'll take that. And we invited uh, Ermana Stein and Julia Knudsen to be here. If you... I'm going to do most of the presentation, or all the presentation actually, but um, if you want to go deeper into this document, I know you brought your binder, Mayor, so if there was that, and you get into specific questions that I don't know, that's really why we've asked them to be here, so, um, because I knew I'd be just getting back, I wasn't going to be 100% familiar with the topic, so I'm just, I'm going to do my best. So, we previously provided a more general overview of the new street standards in October of 2022. This presentation will go into a history of the standards as well as details into questions which came out of that October meeting. And really our goal tonight would be to um, get feedback from you on whether or not we need to bring it back for adoption as presented or if you want some minor changes or if you really want to do a deep dive chapter by chapter. So uh, at the end of the day, that's kind of what we're hoping to get from you. Um, let's see. So just as a quick question, when we reviewed this in October, uh, I know that there were a number of items that we had recommended be added. And I'm, I'm going to take the leap and say that we added those items because I'm looking at, I have my October memo here, uh, which was in my binder, and there were some notes I wrote on here about concept plan standards should be added. Um, so we, that kind of thing. Um, as far as I know, this document has, has not necessarily changed, um, but what has uh, what we are doing is addressing a lot of the comments that came out of that meeting. So we're trying to explain uh, where this was at. And I think we we're, um, the, my recollection of the October meeting, we we're right in the middle of the concept uh, of a development approval or not for uh, Park Place concept plan. So it felt a little bit like um, there was some crossover there that we just felt we could explain. So if we want to, at the end of this, add some things, we'll want to go over that. We watched the meeting as well, so that's kind of where our response came from for tonight. Okay? So due to the regulatory nature of the underground um, wet utilities, we've got sewer, water, and stormwater design standards. For We've had those for several years, but we've never adopted a street design standard. So that's what we're here to do tonight. Um, absent adoption of the street design standards, we've instead been relying on a range of guidance, including construction details, unadopted standards, city code, federal standards, county standards, MUTCD or manual on uniform traffic control. And on more complicated development projects, this become difficult uh, target for both the developer and the city's development review staff to resolve. So street design standards have been a long-standing need for some time, and, and, and that need was how funding in the budget and approval of the contract with Kittleson and Associates was justified and authorized. 
The intent of these standards is to specify or guide the design for new transportation infrastructure. And when the real world situation does not fit the adopted standards, this document also provides the flexibility to find a solution that is best for the situation and the criteria to keep that uh, determination aligned with the intent of the standards. One of the questions that came up was, do these standards allow for innovative design? And our answer to that is yes, they do. And, uh, and there's uh, some examples here that are shown that I'll talk through. Climate-friendly neighborhoods are referenced and details are anticipated as part of the climate-friendly equitable communities that are being prepared by planning as we speak. Um, green streets have been implemented over the last several years. Transportation designs have to incorporate stormwater and grading design standards, and I think you'll notice that in a lot of our new neighborhoods where we've got roadside planters. Our historic district and downtown areas have special sidewalk scoring and road name imprints on our curbs. Traffic calming has uh, many options and innovative solutions, so uh, whether that be speed bumps or other creative ways of um, calming traffic. Alternative transportation modes have become just as important in our design requirements as standards for cars and trucks. Special design standards for benches, waste receptacles, tree grates, street lights are also referenced in detail in these standards, some of which I'll be covering in more detail in the next few slides. So what we heard last time, these eight topics are a summary of and um, so these uh, were provided in an attached, a uh, response to these were also provided in an attached memo from Josh Wheeler and will be detailed in the following slides. Uh, sorry for the text size on this. The, the intent isn't for you to read this text necessarily, but this is the table of contents from the street design standards. So as shown in the October presentation, the street design standards are a technical guideline with 10 chapters which provide the detailed design criteria to properly design features or improvements within the right-of-way. These include geom geometric, multimodal, pavement, street lighting, as well as information that uh, complements the reference and references existing standards on traffic engineering, stormwater, utilities, and landscaping. One major purpose of creating these standards was to have the detailed design standards for consultants to use for public and private projects for consistency, which creates anticipated lifespan and safety expectations for the right-of-way. We created these standards to provide guidance where none existed or was lacking in detail. Capital project staff and project development staff have been struggling for years to use consistent design designs which yield anticipated lifespan and safety expectations and had uh, to instead reference other standards, whether they be Clackamas County, ODOT, or national standards. Using these other standards on city roads did not always result in the best design for the location. These standards now provide for that. These standards do not change any existing standards which had already existed in city code or standard drawings. However, they do enhance concept plans where those plans are either outdated technically or silent altogether on the technical standards. One example is how the Holcomb pedestrian plan seeks to use five foot bike lanes, but the modern standard is at least a six foot bike lane, and one room exists separated by a two foot buffer. This is why a reference statement is made that the street design standards take precedence for technical purposes if conflicts exist. Conflicts are rare from what has been reviewed, but they, at times they, uh, they reveal themselves in the review. In the October 2022 presentation, a concern was raised about the precedence of street standards over concept plan. This is only in reference to the technical standard. This is not in reference to alignments or uh, concept plan requirements. In, two, in, the two, in 2005, the Holcomb Boulevard Pedestrian Enhancement Concept Plan was adopted. Park Place Concept Plan adopted in 2008. South End Concept Plan adopted in 2014. 
essentially we've got a lot of concept plans out there. So trying to um, bridge those through a, a design standard that the engineering community is familiar with and our staff are uh, familiar with is what we're trying to accomplish here. And so when there's something special that comes out of concept plan that we want to address in that review, this um, design standard provides that f flexibility. How does it do that? It's got specific criteria, approval criteria, when, when for instance, I think uh, one example that I think of is, you know, we've got a typical curb, planter strip, sidewalk width, right? And when, and our, our code does allow some flexibility with that, but lots of times it's not always clear, and at other times we want, we may, we may need more flexibility. For instance, if there's a significant tree or an obstacle there that makes sense, um, that you know, we'd want to deviate from. This standard has criteria in there that suggests, well, does it, does it meet the intent of the standard, uh, but may not meet the exact footage for a planter width, for instance. Right? So those kind of things come into play. But yeah, that's how. Okay, well, I, I'm specifically thinking about the concept plan that I was involved in, which is South End. And let's say at some point in time we get around to working on that and developing that. What the plan calls for is a different way of looking at how streets are planned because of the water resources that are all over that area. So I would not expect to see a design come out of that concept plan that is the typical sort of, you know, the street is here, here's the grid. What that plan is calling for is a different way to look at it so in order to preserve those water resources and not have so many culvert crossings that the stream would be an amenity in that particular neighborhood area. So what I'm looking for is some assurance that that concept plan will be looked at when we're looking at these street design centers, not as an exception, but as more of this is the idea that we want to get across because we feel that the water resources are important or we got significant trees, I don't know, whatever it is. But the reason, you know, it shows some areas where there is a grid, there's other areas where the street goes over here and it follows this particular creek or something. And I think we ought to, you know, I mean, we, we've spent a lot of time and energy and money on these concept plans and if we're not going to look at them with some eye towards trying to make that a reality, there's got to be something built into this that gives our staff and our consultants some something to say, okay, we're looking at this, and this is how these standards relate to that. Not that one is over the other, but that there's some symbiosis of how those two things can come together. And I, I would, I'm looking for some language in here that gives me that certainty that that we could do that. So but I don't I'll, know if that's. I will, this will be a good place for me to defer to our Kittleson team because I do, it's my understanding and my, my read on this document that we, we're exactly in the same place that you're asking us to be, which is to be, to have a standard for places where we can apply that standard, but there's so many places, especially in these difficult areas. You mentioned South End, Park Place is a really difficult area. So, so I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about South End. I'm either one, deliberately either one. Most of our development areas have, have challenging areas to get to, right? So I think that's what this standard is all about and utilizing as really that first layer of um, filter, if you will, Concept plan is is. I mean, we know where those concept plans. Well, we maybe refer there to needs those to be a footnote or a, a something at, so that when yeah. we're all out of the picture, you know, somebody like, else is understanding what our intent was for that. Uh, I just wanted to note section. Is the green light on? Yes. Okay. They all scooted over a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Angelique is not liking those for some reason tonight. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to section 1.2 with the development resources. This is something up front in chapter 1 that after we present the purpose of the standards and the different roles of the different city staff and everyone that plays into the projects, 
we are highlighting other resources that are to be used in conjunction with these standards. And so the city code is one of those. And then right after the city code is the Oregon City Concept Plans. And so we're expecting people to use all of these additional uh, concept plans to um, you know, understand the vision, understand that original concept, and the goals of the community and the goals of those plans. Um, and then these standards can really supplement the technical aspects of those. And so where those concept plans don't get into some of the, the technical design criteria, that's where they can use these standards to really get into those details. So there's a sentence on that in that section that I highlighted, and I didn't reprint this whole thing. So it says, the standards presented in this document take precedent over Oregon City concept plans, corridor plans or studies, if conflicts exist. Yes, and that was referring to the example that John had mentioned. Um, if a concept plan that maybe was established uh, many years ago says uh, a five foot sidewalk, well, we, we would recommend now a, a six foot sidewalk as part of these standards. So I think we could probably clarify that to note that it's not to take precedent over the concepts, over the vision, over the, the objectives of the concept plan, but it's, it's meant to take precedent over any technical criteria or requirements that have since been updated based on um, more standard industry practice with. Um, okay, but let me give you the what if. What okay. if the five foot sidewalk is more appropriate because of some other, some other standard, or not standard, some other Constraint. Yes, constraint or carrying Absolutely. capacity of the land that won't allow for a five-foot sidewalk. Yes. And this is saying, well, it's too bad, so sad. The six-foot's going to take precedent. Um, there's um, a, chapter two has a, a design modification process, and so this is a process in which you would go through the decision making um, to identify like you had noted, you know, what is the justification? What are the constraints that might lead to a narrower sidewalk? And then it would just be a, a, some collaboration with the city and some documentation of that decision making. Um, the key is just documenting why, and so that way we don't set a new precedent that five foot sidewalks are okay everywhere. It's just meant for those unique situations in which that would make sense. Okay, well I would, I would add that to this so that it's referring to another section that says, okay. oh, by the way, if there is a constraint as opposed to a conflict, then yeah. there is a process by which that can go, you know, it can be, and you could use such as, whatever you think the constraint might be. But I just want to make sure that the, that the, that the vision and the intent of that document is not being change so substantially that it completely changes the whole idea of, the, of, of what the concept, regardless of how long ago it was adopted. I mean, that was, that was a vision. Mm -hmm. And unless we go back in and, and, re, and change that concept plan, that's still, to me, for South End, that's still the, you know, the guiding document. It's what I still have in my head when I go out there and I look and I think, well, yeah, we could have this over here. And mm -hmm. Rose Road, well, how will we take care of all that water that's coming off of that? Mm -hmm. You know, well, we don't put the street there. We put the street over here so that we can have some sort of mitigation of the water that's coming off and use that for storm drainage, I don't know, whatever. But you yeah. know. Yes, I agree. I think we could add uh, some additional language in that section right after we list the other relevant resources sure. to note that the vision, the, um, the concepts, the, the goals of those concept plans are to be uh, maintained, and this is referring more to the, the technical aspects of it. And then we will also refer to the design modification and that decision-making process uh, that can be used for those instances in which um, you might want to do something different than what is listed. Yeah, that would help because, you know, Somebody may not get to that part, but if they know that that's where they're supposed to look, it's sort of cross-referencing where yeah. there might be some change or some some modification needed. I think that would be real helpful because you're you're, right. you're looking at a lot of you know even though the t engineers are looking at this and some lay people are going to be looking at this. Absolutely. Yeah, this this document generally is intended for those project delivery folks, like engineers and planners and and. Uh, you know, Except owners, for project owners, <laughs> who are reading. Yeah. Just, just, just to make exactly. clear on that. So, in the appendices, there's a um, Type One public improvement modification application process, and it it, it requires that 
requestee or or maybe the project team maybe we're talking about it with the developer um, or this could apply to a capital improvement project as well because sure. that's the other kind of challenge is um, a lot of the a lot of the projects that we do within our existing right away don't fit the standard that we would want if we were building you know in a in a brand new dedicated right away. So park place, sometimes we may have to, yeah, Park Place is a huge example of that, right? Because there's, um, that's why we did that, we did that other little recent study, I forget what we called that, but. Um, yeah. Park Place modifications. Trying to, trying to figure out how to, you know, do we need sidewalks on both the streets when there's a current street there that doesn't have any sidewalks or do we want to focus on just, you know, a walkway on one? So there's, this, this standard is intended to kind of say, how it, how it is, and make that pretty black and white, but give us the flexibility to move when we need to move. Okay, thank you. I think that that will clarify that. Okay. Cross sections. There was a request for figures to be added to the standards, and um, the reason why this, the reason why there's not figures in the standard is because we've already got existing standards. In fact, we've got for the street. Um, for, yeah, the street standards, we've got 24 different standard drawings that represent, that we've had and built upon for many years. So, um, you know, those standard drawings have everything from how do we expect a monument box to be set for a survey monument that's in the middle of the street to these cross sections, right? And how those cross sections look. Even, th even though we have a standard drawing, there's a lot of variability within those standard drawings. But those are the kind of things that we, we reference those in this document, but we don't want to reproduce those in this document because then we, we can fairly easily change our standard drawings, um, but trying to go through a, a change in a, pr in a document that's been approved through the city commission is a lot more difficult. And we find ourselves, you know, making, especially those that are related to constructability kind of changes pretty easily. So, um, so we like to keep our, strong, our standard drawings updated on an as-needed basis. Having them in an adopted document like these standards make it more difficult to make the needed revisions. Shown as one of those figures, a portion of the standard drawing for OC 500 for local roads. So this matches actually what's in our municipal code as well. Um, but even that has got, we've got a constrained street section and a standard street section shown. It's kind of hard to read on this drawing here because of the size, but on one side we're showing, well this is, if it were a constrained street section and that's what were approved in the land use, that's what you would design. And if it were a standard street section, that's what that would look like. So sections like these are documented on really we, we have these all drawn up on eight and a half by eleven worksheets that get inserted into the plan set um, and they also include a short list of design and construction notes that go along with them. Flexibility <clears throat> well again this is an area where Kittleson can probably best describe this but the, the industry standard, if I will, is going to these performance-based and context-based uh, context design. Um, as discussed in section 3.1, these standards are to be used as, as a guide and should look at the overall context when preparing design. So we're talking about some of that concept plan language. We've, we, once we understand the context in which that in, intent for that area is to be designed, that helps. This is described further in a um, ODOT blueprint for urban design, which I know Kittleson knows a lot about and has talked to us a lot about. As most street requirements are required as part of a land use decision, these standards need to be clear and objective. This is why initially the standards need to be crystal clear and inflexible, however, provide flexibility for justified reasons um, to this, um, the city uses a process called to change that the city uses a process called modifications, which is in our municipal code. The process for modica modifications is more clearly outlined in the street design standards in section 2.1. Um, so Julia referenced that just a minute ago. Whether a private development or a capital improvement, <clears throat> each project may vary the standards if the project meets all the five criteria listed in the municipal code shown here. 
So these are those five items. Modifications meet the intent of the standard. Modifications provide safe and efficient movement of pedestrians and motor vehicles, bicyclists and freight. Modification is consistent with the adopted transportation and or utility plan. Modification is complementary to the surrounding street design. If the mod modification is requested to, for constitutional reasons, the applicant shall demonstrate the constitutional provision or provisions to be avoided by the modification and propose a modification that complies with the state or federal constitution. City is under no obligation to grant a modification in excess of what of that which is necessary to meet the constitutional obligations. It's a lot of language, but those are the five criteria. Um, Sometimes the developer or applicant will request a variance or modification to the standard the city engineer or their representative is directed by city code to analyze these requests using the criteria, this criteria. There's also an, a, an ask that we provide a red line version of the before and after of the, of the street standards, well, we haven't had them. So um, that's, so this is a brand new document. It was created um, through a variety of, of meetings and inputs, and Kittleson has brought this to us, and they are the author of this document. So, um, so again, just wanted to reply to that one. There was a question about, does it take into any special design standards? And section 5.8 of the standards gives special design items such as stamped sidewalks, decorative s sidewalk scoring, tree grades, benches, and litter receptacles. We also have a detail. We also have detailed all street lighting standards um, here as well as su supplementary standards for wiring and control boxes in chapter nine. Is there any chance that we could come up with a different litter receptacle? receptacle? Um, we can bring you several options. Um, I think there should be more than just those. I, I, I will be honest with you, I'm not a fan. Um, they are particularly the, the tops when they don't get emptied on a regular basis, even though I know Oregon City Garbage is trying, but I have made more than my share of phone calls. Did you know that this one is overloaded and, oh, is it? You know, they just, they're just... So is it that they're not being serviced enough, or you just don't like the standard? I don't. I don't think they're being serviced enough in in, in high volume areas um, where there seems to be a lot of stuff. But I, the design I think is antiquated. Um, it may have been a good design at the time, but you know, I just think we could do do something better. Well, there's. Um there's a long list of uh, trash receptacles. Uh, it's just a matter of, um, you know, do, do we spend the money to take care of all of Main Street, or do we <laughs> do we have different ones? That's been a problem with our street lights, right? So we got, you know, we got a budget for. Okay, if we're going to do these, we're going to do them wholesale. Are we going to are we going to wholesale all around the city? And if so, that way we only have to have one inventory. So we go through a process of selection the right receptacle. And I'm not sure what that looks like, but we're happy to. Well, it, bring that on. It, it, we just have some options. You know, it's just the ones in downtown look very, very, very tired. And they don't really fit. And they're constantly having the tops taken off of them and stuff dumped out of them. The one right next to the elevator where you make the turn, it's... Okay, we'll just, work on that. Yep. Okay. Was, yep. Um, We've got quite a bit in here about street lights. I think the, the main thing, because I want to get through this um, a little quicker, we basically got five areas where decorative street lighting exists. And that's, I'm going to say that generally we have that. Um, that standard has changed over the years, and there's kind of a long history with street lights. Um, and there's, uh, what do I want to say about this? Because Commissioner Smith, I know this is a hot topic for you. I just know that we we've been trying. We're really trying to move towards four different standards, really, in the city, and um, it's just 
the challenge of going through and making those changes, they're costly, right? So we've been taking them on in a piecemeal fashion every year. And, you know, unless we, unless we got a, a big influx of money to replace them all at once, it's kind of like this garbage can problem, right? You do a little bit at, at a Absolutely. time. And we also have the problem with, you know, they're old enough that those manufacturers are no longer making the same style. Or it may be the same style, but it looks quite different. Some have glass globes, some have, you know, translucent, but they're not glass globes. Some have, because they're LEDs, LEDs produce, um, they, just the way they're built, they've got a cap on top, and, you know, so there's just, there's a lot of differences. There's a lot of details about streetlights. We are trying to move towards four different types, and that's what I think the standard represents. And those four include what we see on 7th, which is the, um, oh, what am I? Arc, we, we, teardrop, we them, yeah, arc and then, teardrop, and then other places where we that. have the acorn, and you know we're making our way through uh, through those. There's other things with regard to spacing, like for instance on Malala Avenue, the new section of Malala Avenue. What I was because I I heard about that one, uh, I think in one of these meetings, and we asked a little bit about the spacing standards. So while some street lights broadcast a wide light, um, others smaller. So Malala Avenue, for instance, the spacing on those is very um, dense, whereas on, on the on the old section of Malala, right. On the new section mall, we, we had more driveways, had a tougher time spacing those out, so we went to a slightly different style. And, you know, so if you look real closely at those, there's a slight difference to those. But Chapter 9 um, is dedicated to streetlight um, and streetlight standards, whether it be what they look like or, or what the junction boxes and so forth are like. So just know that um, street lighting, there, yeah, there's... Go ahead. Whenever There's a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, on the questions that we had from October under street lights, because that was the question I asked. There's a little chart there that shows the four different things, four different styles, I guess, that you're trying to narrow down to. It says that um, these are incorporated into Chapter Nine. Nowhere in Chapter Nine is that is that in there. I've been through it like three or four times. There's nothing in there with reference to these design styles um, that you talked about. Uh, plus, these design styles in a box grid does me no good unless I see pictures of them, what they look like. Um, I've wanted to take my own time. I'm just so busy to walk around town and actually chart where all these are because we have multiple light fixtures on same streets. So it's not, even if you did get down to four, I, four or five, I think that's way too many. Holcomb was designed specifically to have those light fixtures, I get that. Seventh Street Arc Light District was specifically designed to have those specific light fixtures, I get that. Downtown has its light fixtures, but Molala should not have multiple different light fixtures going up it. It absolutely shouldn't. And if we, put, in fact, I asked that when we did the Malala project, will this match the other section of Malala? It doesn't. Um, and that I don't understand. Um, I also don't understand why, even if I go down to like um, 10th and Washington, on that one intersection, there's three different light type piles and they're not even the same heights. I mean, it, it's bizarre. So I get fine tuning it, but it has to be in there. I, uh, this is all very technical, but as a citizen, when I drive around town, I'm like, well, why does this side of the street look completely different, sidewalks? I mean, we, we said, wow, well, look at this great Moala project we did. On half the street, the other half is completely different. Um, we have to start somehow, and I get there's lots of years before, but when we talked about the original Malala, we created design standards for that, and that was the intention when we did the second part of Malala to be the same, and now we didn't, so now we have to go back and do it again, and I get that happens to some degree, but we, if you don't have those styles in a visual, which this doesn't, and this document, this piece that says it's in line is not in there. Yes, yeah, so we... That is not in this current version from but October. But this report says but we is are incorporated into Chapter 9. It's not. It will, it, it will be. So what we have done <laughs> is we've identified... Will be, not different. Is. 
We've identified different items as we're doing tonight that are going to be incorporated in the next draft. And so what we've decided is to get all of the final comments and then do one more final draft. And so we have that table ready to go to be integrated into chapter nine and we can include the photos and the additional information. And the intent of chapter nine is really to start creating consistency within the city, to have clear standards and clear requirements that everyone can point to and use as projects occur. And so I think that this chapter nine is really gonna help create more consistency on future projects. And those charts and the additional information will be incorporated into chapter nine in this next version. Okay, I get having flexibility, but it's like, okay, when one side of the street has tree wells, the other side doesn't. One side of the street meanders around things, the other side doesn't. It just looks horrible. Um, and so I, all I want to see is design standards that give us a feeling that, wow, this street looks the same on both sides of the street or one end of the street. Because um, I don't know anywhere in the city where that happens um, yet. Um, and so I'm going to start voting no against some of these new street projects unless I'm assured. Although I voted yes on some of them where I was sure they would be fine and they weren't. So I don't know what to do anymore. Um, I assume this also deals with the, the, the lights themselves other than the style that, um, you know, having orange and red, light, orange and white lights up and down the street all different. Yeah, too. So, so a lot of our old style lights are the high pressure sodiums, they're the yellow lights, and a lot of the um, new lights are LED, they're generally more white lights. And even those can have ranges on them depending on the age. So, yeah, that that's... It's a known problem. We're trying to get through all of our high-pressure sodiums and turning them into um, LEDs. Those are costly retrofits, but we are retrofitting them. Probably 25 a year. Somehow. I, I just don't know. Other cities figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't imagine driving through Lake Oswego and seeing that. It wouldn't happen, right? So, it, it, so if we have to do something to mitigate that, um, or at least put all the orange bulbs on one street and all the red, all the white ones on another, or whatever. But I mean, I could go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take pictures of every light pole in this city if I get a chance to before the next meeting, because it's absolutely crazy until you actually see it. Um, well, you don't. You don't need to do that. We're aware of. I want to do it we because I want, the, I want people to see it. Because I see it every day. Well, I, I drive by. Well, I, 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 I just it on Malala, but you know, it's <laughs> go to go to um, you know Tenth and Washington or Tenth and Main Street and look at that intersection. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, my my only comment about this is that when we did the Seventh Street concept plan, I think you were involved in that. I thought that the lights that we One, two, were able three. to choose which were to mimic the arc light, were only going to be limited to that corridor because it was a special corridor. Yeah. And now Seventh I see Street. we've got Washington, Home Depot. That has nothing to do with the 7th Street corridor, so why are the teardrop style lights I don't know. the same as in the historic part? Because that was supposed to be uniquely identifying because that was the arc, arc light, district. light district. Yeah, and the Holcomb lights were specifically for Holcomb. Street. To, to Home Depot, that, that has nothing to do with Arc Light yeah. at all. That's just, that's Laderette Canyon, which is a whole different sub-neighborhood. We didn't ask for special lights there. Well, we've got teardrop lights on, yes, Washington 7th and 99E. So those were, I yeah, I mean, wasn't they're involved there now. in all of those there are, um, there now, corridors, but, you know, but that again, was we, part of the community feedback that we got at that time. That's all I can say. Yeah, but the community feedback for 7th was that it was a unique right. area from Singer Hill to up to Eastham, and that was, those lights <laughs> were, you know, when we picked them out, like I said. Yeah, there was they, a standard, and they were specific for those. Yeah, and yeah. we said, that's great. This, this identifies that it. area. You know you're in arc light because you've got these really cool looking whatever you call them, teardrop style, but, you know, Home Depot, no, not a cool district area. I guess, so there are some pictures here. We can add pictures to that chart and uh, get that in the next version of the design standards. Um, yeah. I just, I, I think, yeah, uh, I can't answer all the reasons yeah, for why okay. over the years all the streetlights have been different, but getting them into these four groups is our goal. Um, you know, I suppose we can look at budgeting a larger amount for streetlight replacements. Where are the town and country ones? 
Town and Countries. That's Holcomb. So Town and Country, yeah, it looks like Holcomb, and okay. it's it's uh, yeah, shown the there pioneers. with kind of. Yeah, and we didn't put we didn't put those in. I presume those are there from the county. Uh, no, we did we put those did we put those in? Well, that was part of that Holcomb Boulevard Tramp Improvement Project, project and that okay. those are PGE lights. I remember that. Project. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So they're still. Still there. Still there. Okay. Next section. Okay, public outreach and citizen engagement existed throughout the past year, it included notices to the public, notices to public agencies, notices to private consultants, and notices to various city departments. We addressed all the comments, provided those responses to those who commented and received no concerns after comments were addressed. So we, there's been a subspa substantial time was spent internally to ensure these standards were consistent, current, and met the needs of all the departments. Traffic calming, this is another element of the standards. Um, many traffic calming options existed prior to these standards. These standards use section 3.7 to discuss the purpose and need for traffic calming and to reference the many documents that already existed um, in a variety of treatments and improvements that can be made which may improve traffic calming. So the city's, city has a speed hump and sign policy brochure which guide the citizens um, and staff on when to allow that process in such requests. The city has neighborhood fact sheet, which was created by the Transportation Advisory Committee, which is available on the website. And the TSP and Blueprint for Urban Design list various options for traffic calming, included, including not only speed humps and stop signs, but um, chicanes, lane narrowing, landscaping, striping treatments, and other technical, technology, technological devices. So we don't repeat all that as far as I, understand we reference those documents so Absolutely. we think we've got a John, uh, I'm sorry Alan. just a quick question um, Commissioner Mar speaking of speed humps uh, this is something that I've been asked about um, and it's not exactly related to this but I was wondering if you could give a quick update as to what's happening with the speed humps that have been uh, installed on Barker so those um, speed humps were something that we tr were trying on a kind of temporary basis. Right. So um, those speed humps are different than our, the shape of our standard speed hump. Right, and so I was wondering if they were going to be moving because the like, construction, at least for now, has stopped or what was going to be happening because I've had a lot of people reach out asking about that. Right, so the intention was to leave those speed humps in place until the paving for South End Road That's is complete, over. which is After which the, the county spring, has told yeah. us this spring that. or right. soon, as soon as they have good Paving weather. Oh, it's so snowing, we so will, at, when that work is done, then those <laughs> speed humps would be removed. Right. <laughs> they will what? Be removed. Okay. Thank yep. you. Now that's what he said be before that they were going to stay until uh, the weather decided to stop doing whatever it was doing. And there's a spat, pad, little patch of dry, hot weather that you can pave. Mm. So um, again, we're looking for some. Direction here, we, I, I mean, we, we've definitely noted what we've heard, everything we heard from last time, where our intention is to incorporate that into the next version. We can bring that in a, in a red line version, because we've got this version, so anything additional will be in a red line version, um, and we'll, we'll bring that back to you. Uh, we've heard a few things tonight that we can work in. Do you want us to bring that back in, w again in another work session and talk discuss again or is this something you think you could approve uh, with the red line version shown I, and the I'm, other I'm version? There. I just have a question. Where's where is chap the answer to number 10 going to go? Is that going to be like in an executive summary? Because I thought this was a really good summation of what the chapters are about. So if somebody is looking for something they can go to say, oh, okay, well, chapter three deals with the geometric design. Okay, I don't need to look at that, but I do want to know about the traffic multimodal design chapter. So it's your answer to your question number 10, so following like, as a brief summary. So like a, a executive summary. Well, that's what I was saying. Well. Is that going to go in an executive summary? I think it's, I think it's a valuable uh, piece of information. We could include that in the introduction chapter in chapter one, okay. and it could be uh, an overview of the different chapters, and so that way Perfect. everyone could understand. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be great, because that, that just kind of hones it down and gives yeah. you sort of a, a quick, you know, can look at, oh, okay, yeah. Great. Yeah, we'll include Okay. Are we ready to have a red line version brought back? I have. 
a couple of things that I'd like to see cleared up in the red line version. Okay. Okay. Um, first has to do with, um, th this, is, this is real simple. Section 5.1 talks about how speed limits are set, and it's the old way. So it needs to be updated to reflect that we have the authority now, or will soon, however, the, whatever the date is on that. Um, the other question I have is on bicycle lanes. Um, on page 30, there's a table 3.1, and it says, uh, minimum requirement is on-street buffered bicycle lanes, but the preferred solution is to provide separated bicycle facilities. But then on page... Wait, um, can you give me the... So on my document, they've got... What are the page numbers? Yeah. So, okay, so that talks about separated bicycle lanes, not buffered. Um, and then I've got the PDF page, I'm sorry, but um, uh, section 4.2, it's page 54 of the PDF, the bicycle design section, and there it calls for an eight-foot bicycle lane, a two-foot buffer with a separated bicycle lane as an alternative. And th those, to me, it sounds like we're suggesting two different things. And I'm hoping that what we're suggesting is, is the preference is a physically separated bicycle lane, not just two feet of pavement. You see what I'm saying? I think if I'm looking at section 4.2, it says, um, Bicycle facilities are required on all city streets classified as collector street or higher. The standard bicycle width is six foot bike lane, is six feet based on the city code. However, when possible, it's desirable on collectors and arterials to have an eight foot on street buffered bicycle lane. Six foot bicycle lane and two foot buffered. Is that what you're... Right. Your, that's, that's what this standard calls for. Are you wanting to change that? Standard? Well, it says, that it, it, and then it says alternative applications may include raised bicycle facilities or shared, shared use paths. Yeah. But on that table, it said the preference is a separated bike lane as opposed to a buffered bike lane. Yeah, so uh, um, when we put these together, the summary table 3-1, that was more big picture, a vision. Um, but I can understand that you can see some discrepancy or some contradiction about because the code that's the challenge with it the code actually specify what's written in chapter four that four does two and so that's the thing is we at some point the code will need to get to and through an amendment to make that change that's the challenge that we have okay so what we're saying our preference is is a Six-foot bicycle lane with a two-foot buffer. Our on, requirement on the pavement. Our requirement. That's the that standard. I think um, this would provide the flexibility to look at a separated bike lane. Okay. Is it clear that it, that's what it's? But commissioner, I, I think it's a good observation. I think we can probably tweak the table to make sure that those two talk to each other. So that's a good good observation. Thanks. Okay. The only other question I have, and I and I don't want to send us back down street lamp. <laughs> Street Lamp Hill. Street Lamp Hill. But um, leaving high pressure sodium out, uh, I didn't see where we specified an LED color temperature. And that gets back to Commissioner Smith's concern also, because if, if they're not specified for the same color temperature, it's, it's going to look like. And is there a new updated standard? Well, that's dark, what I don't know. I, sky, I, so. I left the lighting industry three years ago, and there was a lot of discussion then about what was the right color temperature for exterior lighting. And I don't know if the IESNA has come up with a more current recommendation or not on what the appropriate exterior color temperature is. But I, I think it's something that needs to be spelled out in our standard, whatever state of the art is. And I'm not sure because I've been out of it for three years. Yeah, um, thanks, Commissioner, for that. We do specify those on our designs, and we can verify if it's in the standard drawings, but if not, then we can add it over here. Yep. I, I think it needs to be spelled out in here. So if we spelled out, we want LED, but that opens up everything from... <laughs>
2,000 K to 8,000 K. Yeah, what color? I haven't seen the purple ones yet in Oregon City, but those, have you seen the, bright, the purple street lights that are out all over? Yeah. It's crazy. We, we have purple in the falls and on the elevator, but um, <laughs> I like those. Yeah. I like those because yeah. they are there change. Any, are there any new standards that have come out so, dealing with like dark skies, you know, the whole thing about, because I heard, well, now this is bad and cities are changing out to something else and, you know, there were those kind of real weird eerie yellow ones that were out there. Well, again, the LED lights, that's why they all are down, down facing yeah. and with the cap on top, so they are dark sky compliant. But, um, yeah, we do, have some, we do have some old lights out there, and maybe, um, I don't know, maybe we need to budget for we, we all heard a replacement. The, the acorn, <laughs> any of the acorn lights are a problem for light spill, and I can testify from that because there's one about 20 feet from my bedroom window. Yeah. at exactly the height of the bedroom window and how it ever got done in a subdivision that went in about five years ago i don't know nowhere near any historic district but there you have an acorn light in your neighborhood not in my subdivision but i border the merriweather subdivision just off of thayer road okay. and that whole subdivision is acorn lights yeah i think i do remember that one we that, that's why i said generally we have these there are a few outliers that i'm not quite sure how they got approved with yeah. um the lights that they got. We had someone on Washington and 13th, basically, they have a two-story house, and there was light spill from the street light in front of their house that was shining right in their, again, a bedroom window. Yeah, acorn lights are problematic. I don't think way. there's my, an acorn. I think it's the one with the cap on the top. But my wife wants getting, me to deal with it with a big rock, but yeah, I, I'm well, not going to resort to that. There, yeah, there was a, like, there's light spill from corner 14. Uh, to this particular house, and they have spoken to Corner 14 about adjusting it. I don't know where that went, so just bringing it up. So, with these changes, are we ready for coming back for a red line version? Yes. One uh, more thing. Yes. So I will. I'm not going to get hung up over this. Um, but this is a conversation that I've had with John about my concerns over. LED uh, lights, while they are more energy efficient, um, there is growing evidence that our usage of them is to the detriment of our insect and bug community, which is important to our broader ecosystem. So that's something that I've talked to him about, um, but I'm not going to get hung up over this, but uh, yes, anyway, thank you. How does it affect, yeah, I, I asked, I said, are there any new dark sky issues? Because I've been hearing stuff about I don't know if it's anything to do with, but we have a monarch butterfly pledge, and uh, I don't know if they're flying into the lights, but what's going on with that? So that that does get to the color temperature issue. Exactly. All right. Unless I hear an objection, um, you're going to bring it back with the red lines and a resolution to approve. Go get it adopted. Okay. Thank you for your time. Sorry that took so long. Excellent slideshow, John. <laughs> it was very enlightening. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting You've late. You've been just waiting for that. <laughs> you have. You have. You have. We have the John. I wanted to make show. it shorter, but Jim Ban just said, "No, John, we need as much presentation as you can give." <laughs> I think he sets the standard for all the other department heads, so they have to achieve the John Lewis standard for PowerPoints. All right, we have one last item on here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, city manager. I do not have any updates for tonight. Thank you. That was mumble, mumble, mumble. I do not have any updates for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> uh, Mr. O'Donnell, I know you don't have an update because we haven't had our meeting yet. No, I, I can give it briefly. All you know, right, I'm, he's going to give a brief update. Well, you know, Pacific Northwest, we take water for granted. I and know. it's interesting that as communities grow, the demand for water will increase. And it's good to know that Oregon City has the oldest water rights in the state. And recently, we have successfully defended them against all comers. So it's kind of a behind the scenes thing of so. great importance now and in the future. End of report. Should we have Mr. Uh, Parno submit, send that to the rest of the commission? I'll call.
call or text him tomorrow and ask him to send that send the total results to, to the city manager okay you probably are you probably already have it don't you i can i can forward it yeah why don't you just forward that to the entire commission so all right we're down to you mr smith um i don't have any reports other than south fork so we're right to that okay adam Yes, so CIC, we met last night, and the biggest topic was um, the, um, we had Library Director Greg Williams come in for a very uh, well-received presentation about the library uh, after-hours usage policy, which um, the whole public meeting space issue has definitely been something that I've heard over and over over the last uh, year and a half or so while I've been on the CIC because um, there really just is a lack of those spaces for our neighborhoods to use um, that is affordable to them. So a huge shout out to our library staff uh, and also to Christina um, for working with the school district as well to get some spaces for them to use. Um, Prior to that, uh, we did hear, we took an entire meeting to also hear from uh, Seth at Summit Development. Um, and he did, <laughs> he did drop the hint that uh, there is a letter of interest from Trader Joe's. So that was interesting. Um, so uh, next down to the 205 tolling diversion subcommittee, uh, we met last month and uh, it was more of a reorganizational meeting because uh, then Mayor Walters is now in the house and so um, there was a vacancy for the co-chair position uh, to which I was elected so I'm looking forward to our next meeting there uh, where I'm going to be working with Commissioner Savas to help uh, shape that agenda moving forward. The big thing right now is that we're all sifting through the draft environmental assessment which has finally come out and has a lot of uh, very good information. A lot of it is unsurprising uh, in that all of these maps that show the, the strongest effects are unsurprisingly in our community. Um, there's a 45 day comment period. Um, ODOT gave us an additional 15 days, which is something, but when you consider the complexity of this document and that they're <laughs> offering 60 days for public comment on this very complex uh, draft document that still doesn't seem uh, sufficient. So at our next meeting, we're going to be discussing a letter uh, that we will be sending in a C4 and hopefully uh, as a city, we will look into uh, sending a letter of our own to help draft the final and revised version of that environmental assessment. And then, um, Yes, at C4, at the broader C4 committee, um, we had a meeting with uh, Mandy Putney and the Urban Mobility Office people from ODOT to further parse out the uh, draft environmental assessment, which is dropped. Um, it's available on their website, and so I encourage anyone who's listening to take a look at it. it you're not going to be able to read the whole thing in one sitting, uh, and uh, that's by design. And um, But if you have comments, uh, there is... Uh, a, a page where you can find out all the ways you can submit that. Uh, and again, I would hope that our body would consider submitting something as well. Thank you. Did you, have you, um, has C4 taken a look at the letter from the executive, not, excuse me, not the executive, the director of ODOT who basically said that um, the tolling project is not subject to any land use, it's not a land use action. I saw that letter come out um, and I responded that I said it was. So, I'm sure we will be. Yeah, it's okay. Um, just to go back on your thing, so Mr. Williams, I'm hoping that you will um, come at a future meeting and give us a little update on the, the process for using the, the facilities, because I think that would be of interest. You know, not everybody goes to CIC, but some of our people here watch this, and um, we have fans all over, as you know. Michael. Uh, Nothing tonight. I gave the C4 Metro report last week at, at the wrong meeting, but <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> now I know the protocol. Uh, I'll, I'll just say real quickly, thank you to staff for the work they did on the retreat. It was terrific. And thanks everybody for their participation. And I hope we move forward at a promptly speedy time frame on making our, these work sessions a more collaborative environment. Yeah. Um, so it's down to me. So I have a, a West meeting coming up. Um, they've scheduled some budget review meetings uh, during lunchtime on, on a day that I can't attend, but they've thrown my, <laughs> thrown my name in for the budget committee. 
Um, Downtown Oregon City Association, uh, we've had a recent board meeting last, actually no, we didn't because I was gone, uh, but I did read our meeting notes and uh, we're moving, the board is moving forward towards getting things in place for the first city festival because that is coming up sooner than we think. Um, we have two new board members, um, one um, uh, business owner from Soul Flags and the business owner from Mary Rose Boutique, so that is nice in rounding out the board. Uh, let's see, South Fork Water Board, you already heard. Willamette Falls and Landings Heritage Area, since our last meeting, we had a retreat at Shampooey where we talked about uh, whether or not the organization was going to move forward with applying for the federal designation. It's apparently still on the table. Uh, the project now is to meet with the new legislative folks, so it would be uh, Representative Chavez de Reamer and also talking to um, Val Hoyle, uh, Representative Val Hoyle, because they're both new to the table. Um, the nice thing that I found out is that uh, for those of you that aren't aware, um, Representative uh, Chavez de Viner is taking over former Representative Kurt Schrader's office, so right down the street from City Hall, so they're going to be close, and that's great because that means I can walk over there and bug them, uh, which is perfect. Uh, and then we haven't had any meetings on the Willamette Falls Legacy Project um, liaison. I will say, uh, I briefly mentioned earlier that I had a meeting with the director and the executive director of the Urban, Urban Mobility Office. They are trying to come back to around to what are our concerns and we want to try to be your advocate. And uh, so Mayor Bielowski and I basically said the same thing that we've been saying the entire time is that um, you know we feel that they're not listening and why hasn't why hasn't your organization gone to OTC Oregon Transportation Commission and said look what we're hearing from the communities is that we need more time we need to you need to advocate for that it's one of the things we told them that they needed to do besides the other thing that we asked them to do they, they are not going to do which is basically just stop the whole thing so that we understand that but we're moving forward the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, through our economic development department I was asked to sign on to a possible op-ed that will go to the Oregonian involving the Enterprise Zones. Apparently there is some move afoot to uh, have this expire and that is something that's been very needed in all of our communities. Um, basically uh, they're present in 35 counties, 143 cities, 15 ports and two lands of tribes. So that, I don't know when that's going to be out but that was uh, coming through um, our friends at LOC. Uh, last but not least, if we have any commission members who want to attend the um, Clackamas Cities meeting, uh, there is a deadline coming up. You need to let Jacob know so he can register us. It's in Sandy. I understand that uh, Happy Valley will be rescheduled because they felt they got cheated because it was a snow day, so they still want to do it. <laughs> and then I think I mentioned last time that the conference um, is coming up, and I've seen the schedule, so I will get back to you all about that, uh, uh, the summer conference. That's from the league. Anything else? Go to the order. Let's uh, let's call this uh, thing over again. Thank you to staff. Um, I also thought that the uh, work session that we had, barring the um, unforeseen circumstances with uh, volume control from our public, I thought that the retreat was excellent. I am looking forward to us um, moving those things forward and um, talking to our community about um, the goals and I thought we did some darn good work. So kudos to everybody and thank you to everyone and also um, thanks uh, to Vicki who supplied the goodies. Um, you know, happy uh, people who are working hard need fuel to eat. <laughs> so being that, we'll adjourn.